Hello, Dr. Goodall. I'm Dr. Lori Vettisavarga, President and Director of the Natural History Museums of Los Angeles County, and it truly is an honor to meet you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We have representatives from the Jane Goodall Institute in the audience, that, and you know who's here, as well as members of the media here at NHM to preview the new immersive multimedia exhibition, Becoming Jane, The Evolution of Dr. Jane Goodall. Thank you for being with us. Uh, it's early evening there. It's a foggy morning in Los Angeles. Well, it's a delight to join you. And um, I just wish I was there in person. I haven't seen this exhibition yet. Oh my gosh, I didn't, of course you wouldn't have, right? Because it was, uh, it opened just before uh, the pandemic. So, okay, well, we hope you get out to Los Angeles maybe, you know, in the spring and have an opportunity to see it because it's really beautiful. And uh, it's an important story. Uh, I'd really, really love to have you talk a little bit about, you know, how uh, you were able to kind of persist from your early years to, to being this intrepid young woman with a dream to learn about animals in Africa, uh, to establishing yourself as a renowned scientist. And, uh, and, and you keep doing this work now as an activist, mentor, and advocate for creating a better world. Um, I know we just were talking about how it's exhausting, but what keeps you going? Well, what keeps me going is that we human beings with our superior intellect have lost wisdom for, well, ever since the Industrial Revolution, maybe even the Agricultural Revolution, we've been trashing this planet and bizarre that the most intellectual creature that's ever lived is destroying its only home. And so we've, we've made a mess and it's very unfortunate. A, for the environment, for many animal species that are endangered, some of them highly endangered, and especially for our children. And so what keeps me going is there's a lot to be done. I'm getting older, so I have to work harder. Well, you know, your message is really critical right now. And, um, you know, as a geologist, uh, as a former faculty member, it, really in the 90s, teaching about climate change and um, thinking back now about the missed opportunity, right? Because yeah. there was a lot of dialogue around climate change in the late 80s and, and we just missed the opportunity to make a change at that time because like you say, people were just not as smart as we should be on these issues. Well, I mean, think even back then there were climate change deniers. There were people denying the loss of biodiversity, although how you can deny that, I, I can't imagine. I mean, just where I am now, this I'm talking to you from the home where I grew up as a child, I would say half the birds that I knew as a child, they're not totally extinct, but they've gone from this area. And certainly the insects. I mean, when I was a child in the summer, you couldn't open the window at night with a light on because the room would be full of insects. Now I get excited if there's one moth or even one mosquito. <laughs> you know, and it, I, I don't think people realize how important insects are. And, and that loss of insects is dramatic for all of biodiversity. Yes, because that leads to the loss of the birds that eat them yeah. and a lot of animals too that really make their living off of insects are such an important part of the of the environment. So, it's, uh, and it, actually, you learn in the rainforest, everything's interconnected and every little species right. has a role to play. And as they become extinct, you know, gradually the ecosystem weakens and is likely to collapse. So, but you, you have hope and, and I, I want to hear a little bit about where you see the expression of that today. And I think it's probably through roots and shoots and, and children. It's more than that. But when I talk about hope, I don't mean looking at the world through rose colored spectacles mm -hmm. and sitting and saying it's going to be OK. I hope it's going to be OK. I, I see it as imagine we're in a very, very dark, long tunnel. And right at the end is a little pinprick of light. That's hope. But to get there, we have to crawl under, climb over, work our way around the many obstacles in our way. And that little light isn't just going to come to us. We have to work to get there. And so that's, that's why it's so urgent. That's what keeps me going. We've got to hear more and more people 
to realize that each one of us makes an impact on the planet every single day. And you mentioned Roots and Shoots. Well, Roots and Shoots began in 91 because I was meeting as I was traveling the world, I was meeting so many young people who had lost hope. And when I talked to them, they were either depressed or angry, mostly just apathetic. Oh, we feel like this because you've compromised our future and there's nothing we can do about it. Well, not only have we compromised the future of our young people, we have been persistently stealing it, thinking that there can be unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources, that annual growth of GDP is more important than protecting the environment for future generations. But still, when they said there was nothing they could do about it, I thought, no, that's not true. This is the next generation. They're inheriting the mess that we've made. If they lose hope and do nothing, we've had it. So Roots and Shoots has its main message. Every single one of us makes an impact on the planet every day. And unless we're living in poverty, we get to choose what sort of impact, what we buy, how we behave. And each group of Roots and Shoots chooses three projects because, as I said, everything's interconnected. Project help people, project help animals, project help the environment, or one big project that encompasses them all. And, and you've seen this grow, the, the program's growing. It's in 65 countries now, is that right? 65 and growing. In some countries, it's just a few, you know, little groups, but um, it's growing. Everywhere it starts, it seems to grow. Do you have um, alumni? Are there groups? Because if you think about it, starting in 91, right? You've, you've yeah. had folks involved for over 30 years almost. That's right? Right. The alumni are very important because they seem to keep their values intact. I mean, I'm sure they don't all, but for example, the environment minister in Tanzania was in Roots and Shoots and wow. he stood up to the president when that might have meant him losing his life as it right. was he just lost his job. But that's the, that's the case with so many of the alumni. And in Roots and Shoots, you learn that much more important than the color of our skin, our culture, our language, our religion even, is the fact that we're all human beings. Yes, we are. And we are human beings as um, also the most invasive species. And so it really, we really do need to step back and take action and responsibility for, uh, for where we are today. I, I think one of the things I would say about the Natural History Museum here in Los Angeles is we're really um, you know, kind of at the forefront of talking about urban nature and the fact that over 50% of the world's population lives in urban environments now. And so awareness of what's in our, uh, our environment is really critical as we think about conservation. And I know you've thought a lot about this too and how important urban nature is and, and would love to hear you reflect on that a bit. Well, uh, you know, a sad thing today is the way that young people are getting dissociated from nature. And sometimes it's because they live in the middle of the inner city surrounded by concrete. And you know, when you go through a city, you go to the affluent areas and there's all these trees and gardens and flowers, suddenly it changes and it becomes just concrete and grim. And you know that you're now in a deprived area. But um, <clears throat> you know, one way of improving people's health and helping children to get back in touch with nature is bringing nature into urban areas, planting trees, greening it up, letting, letting children, starting very young, Roots and Shoots begins with preschool. And the younger you get children, the opportunity of actually being in nature, you know, and little children, they're so fascinated if you put them in nature. There was a little boy the other day three years old and he was looking very intently at a snail you know how they glide along the ground well he was watching it and suddenly he picked it up popped it on the window pane and ran inside to look i mean that's the curiosity that's natural in us that's how we've survived through the millennia we we're curious we investigate we understand and that helps us to move forward it's so true 
Yeah. We had a we had an event um, maybe three years ago talking about urban nature and um, our video feed cut out. So I invited uh, anybody wanted to come up and talk about something they saw that day to come speak at the podium at a press event. And these two um, boys, they must have been six and nine, came, they said, I want to come up. So they came up to the mic and they told, they told a story about walking to school along the sidewalk and looking up in the tree and seeing a morning dove and how they could see how the dove had, you know, collected bits for its nest. And boy, there wasn't a dry eye in the room. It's that, you know, there is nature. It's, a, it's about being aware and then cultivating and then making sure that it, you know, it, it fosters and thrives. And people are not aware. You know, I was in an airport the other day. You know how sparrows sometimes fly around in airports? And here was this pair, male and a female, and there was a crumb on the ground and um, they were courting. So the male would fly down to get the crumb and somebody would walk past, you know, buried in their iPad or whatever. And he'd go up and she'd think he'd got the crumb and she'd be, ah, you know, begging. <laughs> and this happened four times, the fourth time he got it and fed her, but nobody noticed. Yeah, it's too just, busy. Yeah. we're too busy. Not, not being aware, but we are cultivating that awareness here. Um, one of the other things I wanted to, to talk to you about is just your persistence as a scientist and going up against a paradigm. And I know you've talked about how um, you just kept doing your work. Well, and, the thing was, you know, that I didn't actually set out to be a scientist. I wanted to be a naturalist. Right. I wanted to live with animals and write books about them. So amazingly, you know, I saved up and I got to Kenya and I heard about Dr. Lewis Leakey, famous paleontologist, and went to see him. And he took me, he took me on one of his digs to Olduvai actually. And he was impressed by how I behaved when I met one evening a rhino and one evening a lion. Because the other girl and I were just allowed to walk out on the plains. And that led to him giving me this opportunity of going to live with and learn from not just any animal, but the one most like us, you know, with whom we share 98.6% of our DNA. And so I was with the chimps about one and a half years, gradually got their trust, took a long time, so, saw tool using, tool making. That was the breakthrough that brought the National Geographic into the picture and so he said now you've got to get a, a degree because you we want other scientists to listen to you and you have to have a degree and we've got no time for an undergraduate degree i've got your position at cambridge university that's the uk cambridge mm -hmm. um to do a phd in ethology i didn't even know what ethology <laughs> meant you couldn't google anything back then it was right. letter writing if it was really important it was a telegram but that was expensive so i get to cambridge and imagine i'm, I'm nervous obviously right and told i've done everything wrong you shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names that's not scientific they should have numbers you can't talk about their personality their mind or their emotion because that's unique to us you can't have empathy with your subject You've got to be objective and i was actually told and it was in the textbooks back then this is the early 60s the difference between us and all other animals is one of kind mm -hmm. well fortunately i'd been taught as a child by my dog he's behind me there my dog rusty i knew that they were completely wrong in this respect so I didn't confront them. There's no point. I just quietly went on talking about what the chimpanzees did. And then, of course, the geographic sent Hugo van Lauwijk. Many of his pictures are in this exhibition. And when his film started going around, the scientists just had to believe. What with my detailed notes and his film showing the chimpanzee doing what I said they did. But it's, yes, and that footage is amazing to see. It really is. But your observations, the meticulous notes, all of the, you know, collection of data over the years spent there is remarkable. And it's changed the way, you know, we think about being human. Yes, yes, it, it, it has indeed, because, um, you know, we now know that we're part of the animal kingdom. But realizing the closest thing 
living thing to us today is the chimp gives you an opportunity to stand back and say well gosh we share all these genes with them but we're different i mean you know we're talking like this we've got the internet um we have beautiful built <laughs> buildings like your museum we design exhibits we've sent people up to the moon um so the difference is the explosive development of our intellect how bizarre then that the most intellectual creature to ever walk the planet is trashing its only home. I, I was just thinking that, and it's, we've done all these things. We can address these issues. We can, it's, it's we critical can. that we do. Yeah, we and what, what, what kinds of things do you, um, when folks ask you what as an individual? Well, first of all, unless you're in deep poverty, you can think about what you buy. You can ask how many miles has it traveled? Did it harm the environment in its production? Was it cruel to animals like factory farming? Is it uh, cheap because of unfair wages or slave labor? And if so, don't buy it. And the consumer pressure is making a big, big difference. Mm -hmm. Finally, people are realizing. Finally, people are moving to a plant-based diet. Yes, and I, I hear that you actually um, uh, have tried the plant-based meats. Oh, yeah, they're too like meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, here we, we talk a lot about um, the ways that uh, plantings, native species and encouraging that type of planting in our local environment is really critical to fostering um, biodiversity and, and that's a that's a big difference that particularly as you say folks who can make choices about what they're putting in their gardens they can they can do that and ensure that they foster a healthy environment yep and we can you know set about some of the things we have to do if we want to come through this crisis we've got to ban um what they're calling conventional farming both the growing of crops with monocultures and all these toxic pesticides and herbicides, you know, chemical things that are killing the soil on which we depend, having massive effect on biodiversity and ban the intensive animal farming, which is not only cruel, but laying waste huge areas of the natural world just to grow the grain, masses of fossil fuel and and um, they're all producing methane. We, well, we all do, but <laughs> cows yeah. belch as well as, as well as, well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we actually, um, here, we have an edible garden. We, we took out uh, the parking lot that used to be on the north side of the Natural History Museum, and we have beautiful nature gardens. We have a nature lab. We're all about, you know, sharing LA's nature um, with our visitors, and we have an edible garden. A lot of people don't think about where their food comes from. No, they don't. Well, how can they? How can they? I mean, you know, it comes from a supermarket, right? Right. And unlike me, when I was four, we lived in London, and mum took me for a holiday in the country, and I had to collect the hen's eggs. Hens, of course, were running around free, like the cows and the pigs. And I was asking everybody, but where where does the egg come out of the hen? I couldn't see a hole that big and nobody told me. So apparently it was four hours that I hid in an empty hen house and I saw a hen lay an egg. Well, you were, uh, you were definitely the person to be watching those amazing chimps and Gombe. That's, you started young with your observation skills. Oh, I did. That was my first real animal behavior, except Mom said that when I was one and a half, I was already doing things like taking worms to bed. And she said, you were watching them as though you wondered, how do they move without legs? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And Rusty was very important for your uh, understanding as well of, of animal behavior. Yes. I mean, dogs are definitely my favorite animal. People expect it to be chimps, but they're too like people. I mean, there's some wonderful chimps some wonderful people but there's also some pretty unpleasant chimps and there's definitely definitely some extremely unpleasant human beings so dogs are your favorite <laughs> so, 
and you know Russell, i've had known many many dogs once i started gombe and traveling i couldn't have my own dog but it's always dogs in the family i've known dogs so many but rusty was absolutely different he didn't even belong to us he lived in a hotel round the corner and he just started coming and he, he'd bark outside the door at 6 a.m go home for lunch we didn't feed him and then we'd throw him out at uh, 10 o'clock or so <laughs> when we went to bed and he was just extraordinary uh, well we're glad that we had that he's early in the in your story in the exhibition do you have a favorite part in the exhibition I haven't seen it yet. Well, you put you but you were involved with it. Weren't you involved with the storytelling? I know you haven't seen it, but is there a favorite part of your life story? How's that? Oh well, is there a favorite? I mean, I I love the places where it points to animal intelligence because so many people don't just don't know that, um, and I know this is a nice part of that. Um, well, we think, like the hologram. The hologram of you talking is amazing. Yes, I, I've heard that, but I need to see it to really, you know, get the feeling of what I like best. What do you like best? I, I like the hologram because I just feel like if you're sitting there, you feel like you're, you're with you. Because um, this the whole story is, is remarkable. And the end, of course, the action, the action piece, you know, people need to make a commitment to action. As you say, hope, it's not passive. We need no, to take action. We definitely need, and that's why, you know, young people are such an important element. And yeah, yeah. We've, we've, got to, we've got to eliminate poverty too, because if you're really poor, you can't make those decisions and you destroy the environment just to live or buy the cheapest junk food just to survive. You can't ask the questions we can. And, you know, hope also in the resilience of nature, like you changed a car park to gardens and stuff. Well, that was once concrete and dead, and now you've brought it back to life. Gombe at one point had been part of the Great Forest Belt by the late 80s. It was a little isolated island of forest surrounded by bare hills. And that's when I realized if we don't help these people to find a way of living without destroying the environment, we can't save chimps forest or anything else. And so we began our Take Care or Takari program which is very holistic. It includes things like scholarships for girls so that they can stay in school during and after puberty, have a chance at secondary education, um, microcredit, giving people a chance to start a small business. And we provide family planning, which is eagerly received because the people know a way out of poverty is a good education. And they can't afford to educate the eight or 10 children that they used to have. And so they welcome, they welcome this family planning information, which by the way, as with everything else is delivered by the local people, not us. You know, right at the beginning, we didn't march in like a group of arrogant white people. Uh, you've made a mess and this is what we're going to do. We just sent in a hand-picked team of local Tanzanians to ask them, what do you think we can do to make your lives better? And that's that's why this Takari method, I think, is so important. And there's about to be a book coming out about it. Oh, and, boy, that, that's great. That's great, because we need to see those, those yeah. models, because we need to scale up, and we need to really think about partnership with community. That is really critical. And what does the community need, and how can we help meet those yep. needs. So we think about that at the Natural History Museum. Of course, you know, we do research exhibitions, but we have a really robust education program. Um, we have an all girls now adventure in nature camp that we, we do. Uh, and it's really important for us, particular in Los Angeles, which is a you know, very diverse community that we are reaching as many kids as we can through our programming. So you talk about collaboration and cooperation. So how about collaborating with us with Roots and Shoots? Absolutely. And I, you know, I have, we have been talking about that and we're excited about what we can do in collaboration. Yep. We can, because when you get together, you can do so much more. Right. Yep. It's, it's true. And, you know, we're, we've got a new project here with a new auditorium. So in a couple of years, we can beam you in from England into our auditorium and we can have a lot of kids 
engaging yeah. with you. So we're excited about that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, is there any message in particular that you haven't already, you know, shared with us that you think Los Angeles in, in particular should hear? Well, not necessarily just Los Angeles, everybody. You know, the main message is that every individual matters, has some role to play, even if they don't yet know what it is, which you wouldn't as a young child probably, and makes a difference of some sort every day. And as long as you're not in dire poverty, then you can choose what sort of difference you make. And I think when people understand that although picking up trash or watering plants or doing something to help nature, it may seem insignificant because what difference can I make? Just you wouldn't, but now there's now millions, hopefully soon billions of people all trying to do the right thing. That's the real hope. We all, we all need to take action in order for collectively yep. change it's to one of us. take yep. place. Yep. And that is, that is a, a message that I hope everybody in LA hears and beyond. That is um, critical. Yep. And by the way, I can't let this end without saying that, you know, so much of what I do is, first of all, it was made possible by a, my amazing mother. But secondly, the friends I meet along the way, and in particular, the staff and volunteers and boards of the Jane Goodall Institute, because that's, that enables me to get the message out. We've got 24 Jane Goodall Institutes around the world now. Oh, that's wonderful. And it, it will keep spreading. And we're excited about the collaboration as well with the Institute. So I'm wondering if we have, um, if you have a little bit more time, we have a couple of questions from the media. Okay. So um, the Beverly Hills Patch is interested in knowing if you're involved in the climate conference and if you have anything you would like to say, President Biden, regarding this, what would it be? Uh, well, I'm not at COP26, I'm not in Glasgow because my doctors don't want me to be because I'm so ancient and also I have slight congestion from having bronchitis. So I'm at risk and well, I want, I don't want to just, you know, because you can get long COVID which damages your brain forever. So uh, I've done so many little talks and messages and lectures for COP26 all over the place and but I'm not there. What would I say to President Biden? Um, just that he's now in a position where he can truly make a difference to the future and to think about that and think very carefully about what sort of difference he'd like to see. Yeah, well, I hope he gets that message from you because leadership right now is critical. Um, let's see, Long Beach Al, Al Diaz asks, how difficult was it to make, uh, how difficult was it to make contact with folks on your first, your first trip to Gombe? Well, it took four months before I could get near the chimps without them running away. <sighs> and it was thanks to David Greybeard who lost his fear of me before the others and showed me tool using and tool making and then really helped me to get to know the other chimps because if he was in a group that was ready to run and he just sat there calmly, you could see them looking from him to me and back. And I suppose they thought, well, she can't be as frightening as we thought. <laughs> now we've got another one for you. Um, out and about with Roger Martin. I keep um, asking about your views about factory farming. I think you've expressed those already to us. Uh, and then he has a question. Do you feel that zoos are doing more harm than good to animals? It depends on the animal and it depends on the zoo. Right. But the really good zoos, there's no question, but they're doing, they're playing a very important part in conservation. They're involved in breeding programs and saving animal species from becoming extinct. The good zoos have understood that animals are individuals and you don't just have a species enclosure, you have an enclosure that actually works for the different individuals and 
put the groups right and have, give them the sort of space they need. And, you know, children come in to a good zoo and so many people have said, well, I went into wildlife because I used to visit the zoo. Yeah, and, and I know that the Los Angeles Zoo has a very strong conservation message. Yep. It's very much a part of what they do. Um, so I think last question, Ariel Wessler from Spectrum News One wonders what your message would be to um, aspiring female scientists. The same message that my mother gave to me when I was 10 and announced that I was going to grow up, go to Africa, live with wild animals and write books about them. Everybody laughed. How will you do that? Uh, you know, Africa's far away. You don't have money. We, we had very little money. And you're just a girl. Girls don't do that sort of thing. You know, we're going back along many, many years now. And, but mum had another message. If you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, maybe you'll find a way. And I would say to young girls today, you know, there still is discrimination in business, but it's much, 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 much less than when I was growing up. It's really changed. I mean, look, look at you. There you are, the head of this great um, museum. And that probably wouldn't have been possible when I was growing up. So change is happening. And I would urge the young people not to be aggressive, but just to prove that they're as good or better than their male counterparts, often better actually. So, but I would have one message for the media too, since they're all captive and listening. And that is that media is filled with stories of doom and gloom about the environment, which we need to know, but please give more space to all the amazing stories and uh, the incredible people doing amazing things to help the environment to slow down climate change, to restore destroyed landscapes. Please put more time and effort into those stories as well, because that's what gives people hope. And I think that's the perfect way to end this uh, delightful uh, time that I've got that I've had to spend with you, Dr. Goodall. Thank you so much for your time, and we are really looking forward to greeting you in person. We hope at the Natural History Museum for your first time through the exhibition about your life. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to that visit this spring. Let's hope that we get um, this pandemic under control so that you can come join us here. I hope so. I've got so many wonderful friends in Los Angeles and I miss them. So hello to them all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you too. Have a good evening. Bye.